Hi friends, Tony DeWitt here, Missouri Appellate Attorney and a guy who likes to make the law make sense on YouTube. Here's what we're discussing today. This initially started out as a much different video. I was going to preview the Adelson trial that's coming up on September 17th. But I saw something last night on YouTube that made me shake my head a little bit and realize that that there was something to be said for perhaps looking at this in a little different way. So that's what I'm going to do. The first topic that I want to address is what I would call uninformed speculation, or essentially circulating rumors from the rumors mill. In a situation like the Adelson case, where there are all kinds of hangers-on around the courthouse, you'll have people in the clerk's office, You'll have people in the judge's office. You'll have court reporters. You'll have people who eat lunch together. And, of course, there's whispers back and forth. Now, the report that I saw last night on YouTube was essentially that an indictment for Wendy Adelson is coming like tomorrow. Now, I may make a complete fool of myself here in terms of, you know, maybe tomorrow there will be. But I have reason to doubt that. And I think if you look at the history of this case, you would, you would probably doubt it a little bit yourself. First of all, this is a major case. There are a lot of moving objects in this case. There are a lot of witnesses. There's a lot of video. There's a lot of audio, all kinds of stuff. And there are experts. There are cops that have to appear Every time somebody shows up as a witness in that case, they have spent at least one hour and probably more like four hours with a district attorney. And they've spent that time with them in order to make sure that when they testify, they get the entire story told, they know what questions are coming, and they can prepare to answer them. It's called witness preparation. And one of the reasons they spend so much time on witness preparation is because you have to prepare all of these witnesses for cross-examination. What did they do in the last trial? What, is, what are they likely to do in this trial? What are the questions likely to be? What are your motives that are likely to come under fire? What are some of the things you've written in reports that you might have written better, but that you can explain? All of these things have to be done in order to keep the other side from making your witness look like a complete boob. Of course, that takes a lot of attorney time, and there's only so many attorneys in that office. I'm sure that the Leon County Prosecutor's Office does not have a, a huge staff, so the staff that they have is going to be focused on this case. Now, if you look back, they went after the shooter first, or shooters, I guess, first, then they went after Katie Magbanua. Then they went after Smiling Charlie. <laughs> what an idiot. And then they went after, help me, I'm being recorded, but I can't shut up, Mrs. Adelson herself. And so they have sort of been following the nominos. And in the Magbanua case, I know, and in the Charlie case, for sure, Wendy Adelson testified. Now, I haven't seen her testimony in the Magbanua case, but anytime someone is compelled to testify and they are granted use and derivative use immunity, such that nothing they say in that trial can be used against them, it presents a little bit of a hurdle, something maybe not a major hurdle, but it presents a little bit of a hurdle to prosecuting them for the same crime that they are testifying about in that case. And of course, what they're testifying about in that case was Charlie Adelson having cooked up this plan to unalive Dan Markell. That is, it's not an insurmountable problem, but it is a problem. And the reason that it's a problem is because let's suppose that during the course of the investigation up to the point where Charlie Adelson's case was done and, and Wendy had testified... Let's say that a week or two weeks later, they discover some fact that they were not aware of that pertained to Wendy. Well, now, because she's testified, 
the argument from the defense counsel will be that that was discovered as a direct result of her testimony and it's inadmissible. And anything she said is going to be inadmissible unless, unless she lies on the stand and she's not going to take the stand in her own trial. So they can't play any of that for the jury in her trial if they were to indict her and bring her to trial. In addition to that, I mentioned this before, and people were really kind of ugly to me about this, but Wendy handled herself pretty well on the stand. She didn't take the bait in, in that when she was asked what I would consider to be a leading question that contained facts, she simply said, well, I disagree with your fact about this, and she answered the question based on what she wanted to put forward based on her narrative more so than the prosecutors. And the prosecution, when they were questioning her, were not really aiming, I think, at implicating her, although they would have been happy to do that. What they were really aiming at was implicating Charlie. And because they can't use any of that testimony, Wendy Adelson could have confessed on the stand if she'd been guilty, and she'd have been fine. So, again... <laughs> That's a real problem for the, uh, for the prosecution in this case. And I would posit one more thing, and that is they really didn't need Wendy's testimony to convict Charlie. They had ample evidence to convict Charlie on the uh, videos and audios that we'll talk about here in a minute. So generally speaking, they did it, I think, just to provide some additional information but you don't give a witness use immunity and derivative use immunity if you really plan on going after them later on. At least that's been my experience. That's what I've seen in cases that I have worked on and covered. So in my mind, that sort of works against the whole narrative that Wendy is going to be next. I think if there's going to be a next, it will be Harvey. But if they indict her, and, and I'm wrong about this, I will be the first to admit it. I certainly have no contacts in the courthouse. I don't have anybody who's feeding me information about what is or what might be. Instead, I'm just waiting for the information to come out as it comes out from the prosecutor's office, and we'll deal with that at the time. My speculation about what the prosecutorial team knows, what they plan to do, who they plan to go after, is just that. It's speculation. And I get really annoyed, I don't know, maybe you do too, when you'll see a, a, a thumbnail that says something like, Trump indictment dismissed by the Supreme Court. And you go and you click on that, and the actual video doesn't contain that information. They talk briefly about that, but inevitably it's not what the thumbnail says. The thumbnail being clickbait. We'll get you to click, we'll get you to watch, and we'll take whatever two or three minutes that it takes you to figure out that the thumbnail is a blatant lie. I don't see that as a particularly wise way to build your channel, but hey, what do I know? You know, I'm, I'm certainly not Mr. Beast here. Now, the second thing I wanted to talk about, which is essentially the Donna Adelson trial that's upcoming and some of the evidence that will likely come in. Donna Adelson's trial is coming up, and we know that there are a lot of things that came up in the Charlie Adelson trial that are going to come up in her trial. And the reason we know that is because one of the features of the Charlie Adelson trial was the bump, which you may recall was the undercover agent approaching Donna Adelson out in public. And then the phone calls that resulted from the bump. And those things are going to be front and center in Donna Adelson's case. And I believe, I think it's pretty obvious, actually, that the state has more than ample evidence to get a conviction on circumstantial evidence alone. But when you add in all of the things that the woman said... It, it, it boggles the mind that you could know that the phone call you are making to the jail, 
to talk to your son who has just been convicted of the crime that you are certainly under suspicion for. And you would then talk to him about how you are planning to flee the country and you're thinking about getting on a plane to Vietnam and then you buy tickets to Vietnam. I mean, gosh, you know, the TSA doesn't share information with the FBI or anything. They're not, doesn't all go into one computer. There's no way for the feds to flag that, right? I mean, surely not. But that's how the woman got snatched before she got on the airplane to fly to someplace without an extradition treaty. I don't think she understands just how much evidence they have against her. I think if she did understand, she would have pled. But ego and hubris are two things that often keep people who know in their heart that they are guilty as sin from pleading guilty. Because the penalty is going to be the same whether you plead guilty or whether they're convicted at trial. So they are willing to spend their grandchildren's money, so to speak, on, you know, on basically an attempt to pull off a miracle. I used to have a friend who would say, whenever I would point out that the case was pretty tough, he would say, well, there were three acquittals at Nuremberg. I doubt very seriously if there will be an acquittal for anyone named Adelson that is currently on trial. Now, it may be that some of the talk about another indictment might very well be for Harvey, because Harvey was uh, may not have known about everything, but I believe he certainly found out about it in time to have blown the whistle. If he had been smart, that's what he would have done. He would have protected himself. But blood is thicker than water. Now, I want to turn first of all, to this bump. And I'm going to use some of the testimony from Charlie Adelson's trial. Let's look at the bump where the undercover officers approach her on the street and essentially give her a note. Excuse me, Mrs. Adelson? Hey, Dylan, just want to give you this. Um, Listen, you. <laughs> no, don't be scared. Listen, I just want to let you know that uh, we know that your family uh, has been taking care of Katie and her friend Ruto for quite some time after your problem of more than we talk. And I want to let you know that my brother, he's incarcerated. He helped your family with this problem you guys had up north. And we want to make sure that he's going through some rough times. We want to make sure that you take care. Of, the, of what he's going through, the way you're taking care of Katie and uh, Tuba. Well, this will explain it. So that, that bump led to her making phone calls. And of course, Charlie's line was tapped. Donna Adelson's line was tapped. Wendy Adelson's phone may even have been tapped, but I don't believe they called her. Again, because at least from her point of view, her take on all of this is, hey, if these fools did that, it wasn't what I wanted done because they were killing the father of my children. And you can dismiss that if you like, but, you know, I've, I've actually seen divorced women who have said things to that effect about their husbands or their ex-husbands. Look, you know, I, I don't want to be married to the guy, but I don't want anybody hurting him because, you know, they might screw up and do it when my kids are there. You know, I wouldn't want that. But that's her story, and that's basically what she would say. At any rate, it led to these phone calls. Hello? This is, this is Mrs. Adelson. Is this um, no. Sammy? Sammy. Okay. My grandchildren had my phone before, so... Um, I you Adelson? I'm Mrs. Adelson. My yes, friend. yes. Yeah. My grandfather yes. had my phone before, so that's when I just thought that you called. Oh, okay. I was, I, you, I was, you left the message on my, on my voicemail. Right, I did. No. <laughs> this is my problem. You approached me on Halton Road. You handed me an article from the newspaper about my ex-son-in-law. You told me I need to call you and help your friend who was in prison. Now, at the time you did that, I didn't understand what you were talking about. I didn't call you back. Then 
you mail me a threatening letter. Then you send me a text message to my phone that says I'm not taking you seriously. So I am taking you seriously. And I really want you to listen to me. I, I have to tell you, I mean, this is important. I, I have been so stressed out. I have spoken to 10 or 12 people who are close friends of mine, telling them about this and basically picking their brains and asking them what I should do because I don't know your friend who is in jail. I don't, I, you, you mentioned a name. I don't even know his name. I never spoke to him. I don't know what he looks like. I've never met him. I, I'm sorry your friend's in jail, but I don't know what that has to do with me. You, 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 I, know, you know exactly what it has to do with. You, uh, you know exactly what it has to do with. Listen to me carefully. Listen, listen, to me, listen to me. You, you, got, you, you just got to you just gotta listen to me. You need to you ask gotta, your friend yeah. who this person looks like, what their name is, something, because I know there's a big reward out there, and if you need money for your friends, that's the way to get it. I mean, I'm asking you nicely. I don't know who he is. I am out of the loop. It is not me. If I can help, I would help. I mean, I, I, that's what just I'm like I told, just like I Just like I told you, listen to me. Just like I told you that day, we know, what, we know that, that your family had a problem up north. We know that that problem was taken care of about a year and a half, two years ago. And we know that Katie has been taken care of. And has been taken care of. Now, now my brother, my brother in, in jail, he, we were in Broward together. He told me the whole thing. And he hasn't been taken care of. You know. Now, all, 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 we're, all, all that's being asked for is 5, 5K. That's all we're asking for is for 5K. And he, I, he told me everything, and I know everything. I know who's involved. I know everything, and I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll get the 100K for myself. You know, I'm, I all I ask is to send the 5K. You, everybody knows what's going on. I don't. You know, you're saying everyone knows. I know I lost my ex-son-in-law. I did not have anything to do with it. That's why I said ask him. What that's, that's what that's not that's not that's what not my, my brother Tasso told me he told me everything when we were in jail. He told me everything oh. and who was involved. I know everything. Well I don't. That's the problem. I am telling you it's not me. It's not me. I have had a year of aggravation, a year and a half of aggravation over this. My my daughter, my grandchildren. It is not me. And when I asked my friends, what do they think? They said, well, this person needs to get a description of you because of what you look like or you're, it's not me. I don't know who caused this. It wasn't me. Now the cop is lying to her and he is allowed to lie to her. That's perfectly permissible under the law. The cops can lie till they're blue in the face and you can't do anything about it. But what you can do is what she is doing there. She's saying, look, I don't know what you're talking about. And if she had dropped it at that point, she would be just fine. <laughs> but the problem for her was that very much, well, let me explain what the problem is with the detective's uh, testimony in that regard. So why did you select Donna Adelson to be the recipient of this phone? Because we, we noticed the pattern of calls leading up to the murder and uh, around the time of the murder. Um, the calls were always Donna Adelson to Charlie Adelson to Catherine Mag Magbanwa to Sigfredo Garcia and then back. It was always going back and forth pretty much in that order. Um, so we wanted to start it on one end and see what would happen, see if it would if it would uh, travel that same, that same line of uh, person. And of course, what the detective prophesied there is exactly what happened. Uh -huh. She said that someone approached her on the street, uh -huh. called, called her by name, mm -hmm. handed her an envelope with uh, something in it. Yeah. And uh, somebody was, she really wouldn't go into detail. And listen, I don't, I have no idea what this is in reference to. Uh -huh. But 
something regarding her son, something regarding his ex-girlfriend, and the person asking my mom for some money. What? Yeah. So I said, well, yeah. I'm like, first what she was saying, I thought it was like something involved in the IRS or a payment yeah. or something like that. So I don't even know what the it's about um, at all. So somebody just like bumped into your mom like that? Well, they, they came up to her on the street after she dropped yeah. the kids off at school. Yeah. She, I guess she brought them to school. I, I don't even know. But they must know her routine and must know who she is. Yeah. They walked up uh, to her and they called, they called her by name. Uh -huh. They handed her an envelope. Uh -huh. um, and she said they spoke to her for a few minutes. Yeah. Um, and then she said they were, you know, they were making reference to my ex-girlfriend. They got to know what that's about. Yeah. And, and that uh, they uh, explained that they needed to be paid some money. And they gathered evidence from phone taps and surveillance and that sort of thing, and it pretty much put the nails in Charlie's coffin. And I suspect that it will pretty much put the nails in Donna Adelson's coffin as well. She's probably never going to see her son again. She's probably going to go spend the rest of her life in the women's prison in uh, Florida. And that's exactly where she should go if she is convicted. Now, I'm not making any determination as to her guilt. I'm, obviously, that's for a jury. But if I were sitting on the jury, I think there's plenty of evidence that would support it just based on what I saw in Charlie's trial. And, of course, her decision to flee. Because, as I said before, the guilty flee, the righteous are as bold as lions. So this may actually wind up being the easiest prosecution that Leon County has. I'm happy to be proven wrong about Wendy Adelson. If she is guilty and the jury finds her to be guilty then she deserves whatever comes to her. But at this point, I don't think anybody has made a really good case for taking her on, especially since they gave her use immunity for her testimony. Well, that's what I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any comments, drop them in the comments down below. Like, share, subscribe. You know how all this stuff works. You've been here before. At any rate, if you have any questions, like I said, you can also email me at the address above. And if you have the opportunity today, do a kindness for someone. Make the world a better place. Then come on back tomorrow. Join me down here at the beach, and we'll talk about something else that you'll find interesting, I hope. If you like this video, here are a few others you might try, and don't forget to subscribe. Have a terrific day, guys.